work with and kind of do is really help us get things rolling. So um, they're a great group to work with. They've got a lot of information and knowledge on the front floor. But Dean's presentation is, is going to be very interesting for me, just to, the whole process that he manages through. Because Dean brings to us not just a lot of experience from the project, but just a lot of experience of, of managing products and leadership in general. Um, and trying to put together a, an introduction for him, it's kind of hard to trim things out. So I'm going to kind of introduce some of the, the neat things that goes on in Dean's life. Um, he's worked in the field of management in IT for over 20 years. Um, he's held roles as a functional, in functional management, management consulting, software sales, and enterprise applications and global infrastructure. He's held leadership positions in small companies, small private companies, medium sized public companies, and very large Fortune 500 companies. Because of his vast experience around the globe, he's thought, he is, um, thought of as a leader who excels in building teams that produce value for their business. He possesses, he possesses a proven track record that of excellence in the global interpersonal communications at all levels of an organization. Dean's true passion is leading teams to bring about high value, repeatable quality products and services. He's been called a breakthrough leader and turning around teams or programs that are suffering and are underperforming and then make them into a highly significant and highly impactive uh, workforce. Dean is a good standing member of the Product Management Institute, which you guys may know as PMI. Has been connected with them since 1985, I believe. Um, he's certified in ITIL, Lean Sigma, and holds a PMP from PMI. Currently, not only is he working, but he's volunteering as a Boy Scout troop and works on the sponsorship committee of the PMI for the Minnesota chapter. He's experienced functional group leader, program manager, and entrepreneur. Holds a degree from the University of Minnesota, won't that against you, as well as a master or an MBA at Capella University. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dean Moore. Thank you. Thank you. And I do like Iowans. <laughs> They're all next door to me. They live on both sides of me. That's where I get all the Iowan jokes. Is they tell me the jokes. <laughs> so, even one of the guys that's uh, on the finance team is from Northland, Iowa? Northland, Northwood? North Northwood. Northwood. So, uh, welcome. Again, my name is Dean Foreman. I am working at the Lux. Uh, you heard Mike this morning about the Lux. I am going to give you a program manager or project manager view of what we did, where, where we started, how we, what we did while we were doing it, and also where I think it, we are at at this point from a program and also some interaction mostly back and forth so that you can pick this up, take it, uh, use some of the key learnings that we've struggled through and also uh, get a different insight. I hope after I'm done, you can have, you're either inspired or you're asking more questions and have a sense of where you need to go for your next step. Um, so, of course we have to do the deluxe slide. You heard Mike talking about deluxe. There are three divisions or three areas. Uh, we're a Czech company, but we're much more than that. I'm not gonna go into a lot of that, I just wanted to let you know that I am with the Lux. So again, my focus. And a key area here also, or item to talk about is, is I do want to be interactive. Uh, this is after lunch, uh, heavy foods. Uh, Nick made sure there were really heavy foods. So, <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, ask questions. I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask questions. I want you to ask some questions of me if you don't understand. So the we make sure we connect well. Um, one item as, as I'm working on this focus is just to get a sense of each one of you or your areas. What industries are you in? So how many people are in the healthcare type of industry? Okay. Cool. Uh, what about financial institutions or insurance? Uh, government, manu government, manufacturing, okay. Uh, what about agriculture, transportation, other? Legal. What's other? Legal. Legal? Education. Education? Retail. Retail? Okay. All right. Great. So you're across everything. Really, uh, are, how many people are would put themselves on the infrastructure side of the house? People would put themselves on the application side of the house. Well, we are not in IT. <laughs> <laughs> you win. 
Um, <laughs> so, okay, good sense of that. Thanks. I'm going to try to segment this and make sure that we're focused on some of the technical things, but with applications, my focus is on the application side of it. Um, I'm talking about thinking and rethinking. Thinking about what you're doing is great, but as you go through this, you're going to have to rethink a lot of things. You're going to have to say, wow, I don't understand that. How does this come together? Ask questions of multiple people and rethink it as you're going through. So most of this is down this app side of the house that Alliance has on the map. From a program standpoint, we've gone through a lot of these areas, but really my talk is down through this stack of applications. You have a set of applications that you have delivered out there to your desktops or on servers, you already do internal services or whatever. How are you going to take that in the next two, three years and move it to somewhere else? How did we do that? What were some of the ways that we did that? Uh, on that, we had to do some new thinking. We had to have project objectives and go after different projects. There wasn't just one project, there were multiple projects. Some are more successful than others, and some of them came out of something else that we weren't really expecting right away. And then that next step is, how do you manage it as a program? Not just saying, hey, my desktop's done, my, my laptops are out there, my applications are done. What do you do to keep it going so you don't get yourself into a position where you're struggling or you have to reinvent everything? We really reinvented a lot. So think, rethink, or is it rethought? What are these, these pictures? In bed? What's one of the pictures? Tell me what one of the three is that. Think that. Think that. That's right, down there in the corner. What, any of the other ones? Anybody know what the other ones are? Player? Does that take player? Yep. The Sony Walkman. Who had one of those? <clears throat> what are the other two? IBM logo. IBM logo. What's the other one? Not test tubes. It's a Cray. It's a Cray 2. Yeah. You know what a Cray 2 is? Yeah. Supercomputer. Okay. Mike knows what it is. Why, why did I put that slide up there? Because you had to, they had to rethink a lot of what we had to rethink what was going on. The Cray 2 did raw processing power. Is the Cray 2 the one that's doing raw processing power now today? <laughs> oh. Portable computing. Everybody knows what the ThinkPad is. That was that laptop there. Everybody had it. Everybody have a ThinkPad now. Personal portable audio, Walkman, Sony. Sony owned the market, didn't they? They owned it. Who owns it now? Apple. 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 Who are, who's Apple? Aren't they an education computer company? How'd they get themselves into there? Application development. Who owned it? IBM. Who owns it now? Microsoft. Microsoft? Google. Google. It's been rethought. It's not the same model. The desktop, who owns it? Who owned it? Microsoft. Microsoft. Does Microsoft own it today? Is it just one person that owns it today? Is there just one company that owns it today? It was rethought. It's about global. Globalization, organizational transformation. What I mean by that is, and the point of all this is, is as the globe has expanded and as things change in the globe, everything that used to be there, all those technologies that used to be there have all changed. But they've changed because the organization's changed. They thought it, they rethought it, <coughs> and those that didn't have moved on. So over the ages, ages is the next thing. The thing can rethink. Age not being your chronological age. You know, I'm 42, 43, it doesn't matter. It's about ages, over the ages. So four main ages here. So agriculture, we have tools. That was the agriculture age, it was tools. Shannon, woo! Everybody know that, right? Great story. Everybody was not sleeping in their history class, right? Machines was the industrial age. The other age? Information age was technology. Are we still in the technology information age? Is it all about technology? No, I don't think so. 
Is it just about computers and laptops and delivering devices and put servers in the back end? Or is it something else? I believe it's the virtual age. We're talking this whole conference is really all about the virtual side of it. And that virtual side of it is about consciousness. It's about thinking about something that's not physically in front of you. It's about your mind and what you're thinking about. That is tough. There was one question about what do you do with people who are a little older, don't understand the physical. They've lived in the physical world. Mike brought that up. It's about the typewriter. <coughs> it's not about the typewriter. It's not like the typewriter. It's not physical. It's not in front of you. It's a virtual desktop. It's a virtual desktop. Well, it's out there. Where's out there? It's in the web. It's, you know, you have those conversations, and it's a struggle. I don't know if you've had these. Has anybody had that conversation where you feel like you're talking to yourself? It's virtual. Well, it's virtual. It's out there. So it's a consciousness, and it's a new age. And we need to think about it as a new age, a new way. So age definition matters. It's a matter of definition. If you still think it's information age, then you're going to keep delivering laptops and desktops with an OS on them and applications put on them. You're not going to stream apps. You're not going to do those things because you're not thinking that way. Change your thought. Rethink. There's some forces out there that are, are pushing us. And I'm not talking the wind and the hail that could keep from come flying through or anything like that. I'm talking about things of accelerated connectedness. How many of you 10 years ago called overseas? Anybody call overseas 10 years ago? How long did that take? It's how long did it take? Well, the half the time you hit the operator. You had to go through an operator, right? Yeah. Now you grab your cell phone, you dial it up, and bing, five seconds, probably three if you're calling overseas. Eight seconds, you're there. You didn't have to talk to a person, you're there. It's an accelerating connectedness. I can connect with you instantly. We can bump phones and we can share something called our contact information. I look at it, I click on it, and we're talking. It's fast. Might talk a little bit about that. Kids expect something to come back real quick. We have to think about that. We have to think about the globalized phones. It's not just global phones, it's globalized. It's not that I can do, I can create a check here. It's how can someone in Ireland print checks? No, it's not that. That's the global, to have global side. But it's globalized. How can we work together? How can I create the formula for the ink and give you the formula for the ink so you can use it, but you have better paper, so how can you get the paper to me? And you're making your production, I'm making my production, but we both have to make P and L numbers. How, how do you do that? It's globalized. We're having conversations back and forth. We're figuring that out. It's not just, you know, China's making more cars. It's how did China make more cars, and how do we move stuff there, and how do they move stuff there so that we can it's not just them and us, it's a whole group. So it's globalized. Uh, powerful individuals. This one's kind of interesting. If an individual can pick up and put out a Facebook account, get 100 users, get 100 friends, and then start a concept, and that concept continues to grow and more people know about it, that's pretty powerful. That one individual has power across, not geography, but connect. How do they connect? They're powerful as an individual because they can connect. You, you're losing control of it. There's no control. You really don't have that control anymore. So how are you going to make that work for you? Because you've lost the control. And the control is down to the individual. It's not your group. It's not what you're doing. It's that individual. Transference of economics. How many of you have heard of, in, in Africa, how they're able to trade money? You may hear the cell phone, how they're trading minutes. They trade minutes off of cell phones. And that's how they move their money around. Their finances, microcredit and all those, their finances are on their cell phones. You know, think about that. What do you mean that cell phone? Why, how do they have a settlement? How do they how do they do that? But 
it's a transference of economics. They're able to transfer economics, not in the aspect of what we would do, right? <coughs> or give, give paper dollars. You know, they use that. Why would they use that? They can use this electronic form, so the distance is no longer a problem. Uh, there is no intermediary or less intermediaries. The economics transference is happening right now. We're going to see some of that here in the U.S. We haven't seen some of that. Some of the things we did are there, but there's some other movements that we'll see from an economic standpoint of the rest of the world is just as powerful as we are in an economic sense. So the new forces, and it does affect the tech equation that we're dealing with. So rethink the forces, rethink about them. I, I put this one up as a pivot, and I wanted to talk about this and, and to give you the sense as, as we move into the project side of it here. This is, again, about thinking. The pivot. It's not the tipping point. It's not morph corpse. It's not any of those things. It's a pivot. It's a, it's a door. You know how you swing the door open and you have a pivot point? Right? So it's, it's not jumping over something. It's not just uh, leap, leaping out into the no nowhere zone or you got 10% of, of the market, therefore it's going to happen. It's not about that. It's about taking your own thoughts and where you're going and turning this, making that 10% change. So with that, tipping point is a conscious choice, intellectual property is value, and all of a sudden it's a metamorphosis or a morph. Things move. It's not amorphic. Amorphic is no shape. A morph is changing shape. So the so a morph. Who knows what Groupon is? Anybody know what Groupon is? Groupon like Groupon. What was Groupon originally? Anybody know? From Google, it's a coupon site. It's a coupon site right now, right? But before it was. ThePoint.com. And it was asking people for money. That's what they started out in their business model, to ask people for money. Now they're a coupon company. How about Flickr? What's Flickr now? Flickr is oh, yeah. picture, right? What was Flickr before? Flickr was a never-ending game. Did you know that? It's a never-ending game. Started out as a never ending game. They morphed, they figured out that it, that wasn't working. They said, hey, this isn't working. We've got to rethink this. We've got to figure out what this is. Microsoft, what did Microsoft start out as? They built basic for a computer. Now, what are they? The OS, applications, infrastructure, voice, all those things. They all morphed, they all changed what they were. They didn't have a tipping point in that. They started at one point, they were somewhere, then they had to change. They had to think, rethink what was going on. If they didn't rethink, they were gone. They were done. So, enough of that. Those are some theories, some areas that really bring together uh, where we were at or what we needed to think about. We needed to rethink what we were doing. We didn't really understand that there were some other forces in our company outside the world until we got to a, what I'll call the tipping point, or a tipping point. We realized we built all this infrastructure and put all these apps out there and we had some other, we had regular desktops and PEI desktops, and terminal services desktops. But our problem was we couldn't deliver the applications. We had new targets that we had to push these out to. How are we gonna do that? We have two years to do 2,000 apps, how are we going to go through that? How are we going to get that many uh, apps through? Well, we have, we have two people that can do this. There are named systems. How are we going to do this? So there are some four main points that came out of what we call App Stack when we first started this. We thought about it and we said, oh, we're going to do this. This is an App Stack. It's that the end point is really what's on the first part there. So we have multiple channels and very inefficient in delivering those apps. Uh, we had communication troubles across the organization, trying to, a user would come or a group would come and say, we want XYZ out to PDQ and it better be ASAP. You know, that. And you're like, okay, what do those things mean? When do you want it? Who's paying for it? 
no idea. Well, we did, but it took a long time. Very inefficient. Uh, current tool set to even deliver the apps, we weren't there. We had very limited tool sets. Vince, did we have limited tool sets at that time? Oh, yeah. yeah. We're struggling. But we knew we had to do something. We were at that point. And then the current process we had was very inflexible. It was, you give it to me, uh, I sit down, I do what I can. If it doesn't work, I'm sorry, go go hand install it, go do something else, go put it on a share. Bad, not good. Not as good as we should be. We should be world class. We know how to do that. The tools are there. So imminent failure. We were there. We knew we were there. We knew we can't. We know we can't continue with where we were at. So what this is, is you heard Scott Valeri's name come up. Scott did two things. He sat down and did two areas. On the abstract side of it, he did solutions building blocks. That's what SBBs is, solutions building blocks. So he sat down and said, well, you know, there's kind of a solution that we have to work through, some building blocks that we need to put together, some areas, and he's the chief architect, and he's saying, well, you know, out of these solution building blocks, what, what's in there? What are the inputs? Where do we need to go with that? So, of course I turned it off. So why do you turn it back on? Turn it back on. Isn't that fun? Okay, so uh, so we have up on top we have third party shrink wraps, we have our custom deluxe apps, we have web application components, so you have those little lovely little plugins that we all love. Uh, and then we have these other applications that were put out there as support items. We said, hey, let's just dump them on a share in a media library. It'll be good. We'll know where they're at. We'll be able to do it. But then let's pull it through aptitudes, app DNA. We'll take that, we'll get an evaluation of them. Are they red, green, yellow? Give us a sense. Let's use some tools here rather than just guessing. Then uh, admin studio. Oh, point. Ah, see? Sales guys have all the cool tools. Which way do you do it? Oh, there we go. Hey, I'm pointing at myself there. Thank you. Blind you? Yeah. That's <laughs> funny. Uh, admin Studio, so we have App V as well. We can take that into consideration. Scott sat down and then thought, well, we need some scripting to kind of finish that little gap. As you see, it's kind of a funny little gap in there. It's a little... And then also SCCM to deliver it. Now, we delivered to actually five tiers. Tier zero is, is basically your, your endpoint client that has nothing. It's a uh, win TPC or win flip environment. That actually connects the tier three or tier four. So, questions? This is his thought. This is his initial thought saying, hey, I got a problem. Maybe we need to build this out, this application stack over there on the left. Try to build some building blocks, put some software in there. Are any of you at this? Have, do you have something like this? Is this something you guys? Our method. Uh, people before projects. So this is really the project side of things. We had to add some principles in here. You saw the technology, saw what we did there, thought, hey, blah, 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 let's just throw this technology in. But we needed really to build philosophy around the team, what the team wanted to do, and how they wanted to think about doing this effort. So people before projects was important. It was about the staff, the individuals, those that were doing it. Go for the glory. We're going to do it. We're going to go out there. We're going to throw this, put this stuff together. We're going to find the best tools. We're going to link them together. We're going to find what that can be. And sit in the stern of the paddle, that's, that's really for me. Stop being the project manager in the front of the boat. Do anybody have a canoe? Anybody have a canoe? No one owns a canoe. We don't have Let's 10 not even a canoe. So, anybody's ever been in a canoe, 
They're long, little banana shaped. <laughs> sitting in the back, if you just try to paddle by yourself, it goes all over the place. It's also sitting up like this, and a lot of times you dump it and you're in the cold water. So that's my little piece. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this method. So people before a project, people, staffing. You need to have the appropriate talent levels on board. That's internal or external, whatever it is. You need to have the right people. Even if, even if your folks that you have today, or you all that are there, don't have that skill, you gotta get someone in that has a skill, that knows what it is, and you can learn from them. That's one approach. The other approach we took was training. We're gonna, and this was tough, we shut down what I'll call our production area of turning through apps when people requested them for about two and a half months. The organization was having, I wouldn't call it a heart attack, but it was darn close to heart failure as, as some of us stood up and said, no, we're not gonna do that. It was tough. We're not gonna deliver those out, we're only gonna do critical ones. It was a big deal. And then we, because of that, or why, why that happened is because we were trying to get trained for all of the folks. Get them trained up on all those solutions. All this new software we put in the back end infrastructure. And resource management capabilities also. Our, our whole group, it wasn't just about us. We weren't going to do it all. We knew that we needed to have some external help. We knew, we knew we needed to be able to scale up and down. You guys have this huge demand in sometimes for apps being packaged and pushed out. No? Yes? Comes and goes in cycles. Comes and goes in cycles. You guys know your cycles. Every January, everybody wants everything done. Every February, everybody's wondering why it's not done. And by December, they wonder why you didn't get three, three times as much done. You have any kind of cycle like that. We had a cycle of no one knew the cycle. No one had tracked the cycle. No one knew what the cycle was. No one had a sense of what the cycle was. No one knew there was a cycle. So we had to scale. And it was hard to swallow, very hard to swallow for technical people as well as uh, much of our leadership. One of the things that came out was rules on this. This is an actual deliverable. I pulled this out. It was a deliverable of define the rules. Now I have you know, it's a 20 page document. You don't want to the roles, so we had a product owner, we had a business analyst, we had a quality assurance, we didn't call it quality assurance analyst, we just called it quality assurance at that time. We also talked about desktop engineering function, what they were doing, and deployment function, what they were doing. We broke those out because people were filling these roles. Maybe the same person was filling these roles, but it wasn't well communicated to the rest of the team. What are, what are you doing right now? Well, I'm just doing this package. Well, what do you mean you're doing this package? Well, I'm looking at it. What do you mean you're looking at it? I'm, I'm doing some stuff. We didn't know what they were really doing. And individual, between team members, they didn't know what they were doing or where they were at in the process. So defining these roles helped us to define a vernacular or a language that we could all talk with each other on. So helping to also somewhat get a sense of what it is. It isn't a job description, it's a role. How do you play it? So going for the glory, <laughs> the list of glory. We're going to do 10 apps. We're going to get them done in so many days. We're going to establish this value stream map of how this all goes together and all this works together. Standard operating procedures. Why I'm talking this way is this is Scott standing up and writing on the board and telling us everything that's going to go on and how everything's going to happen. And the team's going, oh my god, we're not going to, how can we do that? We don't have any of these things. We've never done these things. Metrics and demand? Oh, what's a, what's a metric? How do, you, how do you define a metric? Anybody have a metric on how many apps you do in a year? How many changes you do in a year? Yeah? How many, how many apps do you think you do in a year? Vince, what are you doing? Less <laughs> 100, and now we get down to about 200, 190. Changes? Yes, there's different changes. Consolidation. Okay. Why 
why did you why did you start measuring? I have to allocate my time. Oh, was it time? So it was a time thing, and time thing is a money thing, and a money thing is a business value thing. You had to help him sell you to your organization. You had to re be accountable to your organization and say, we're really doing something. We're not just sitting here. Vince isn't just a great guy to sit in the corner and do this stuff for us and things seem to work. It's, I actually did something. I got to the goal line. You can see the scoreboard. I got it done. And that's where we were at. We needed a scoreboard. We needed to say what were we doing and what were we not doing. Because there were some real questions. Just get it done. <laughs> OK. Uh, design for external resources. This one was an interesting one. We designed this for external resources, thinking that we need to offshore all of it, or a portion of it. We looked at that. We also looked at nearshoring, pulling it in, having people be in a virtual environment. You can sit in Iowa, you can sit in New Hampshire, you can sit in California and, and do this. We literally thought about that when we put all these little building blocks together, all this technology together. That's okay. Um, and, and in that process, that that's really helped us to scale that, to be able to put together a concept of, great, right, we're going to put the software in, but how are we going to make it so that people can get to it from other areas? What can we do as a group and our team to put software together, to put systems together, to make it so that it's not one-on-one. -on -one. It's not one laptop to one license to one person, and our we're tied to that. We were tied to that. It was horrible. So I had to go, you know, you know, hey, here you go, Dave. We want this done. Can you do it? Sure, I can do it. Tell me when you're done, so we can give you the next one. Now it's all right. You have these resources, three months, and we have this group of. 34 apps, how do we get them through and put them together? Part of that was the next side was prioritized by business requirements. So you have all those apps. How do you prioritize? How do you juggle them together? Well, it's, of course, how do you prioritize? It's the person that screams the logs. It's the one that does an, uh, you know, animated antics. Or is it the one that's delivering business value? Oh, yeah, I have uh, $100,000 in revenue on this. Could you get it done next week? Versus, hey, you know, take you out to lunch, and you're my best bud, and he can come to my cabin. Could you do that for me? We, we, had, we had, that's the way the organization worked at that time, because that, there was no metrics. There weren't any metrics. The prioritization wasn't there. It was bad. So we wanted to go for the glory. We wanted to make sure we could do it and not feel pressured, but feel like we were doing the right things. Sure. So what was the driving time? Was it you coming in? Was it change in management? Was it economy, you know, economic <coughs> concerns because of whatever variables that can lead to? The I think the crazy Scotsman was the first part. Our CIO was saying, I don't care what you do, but you better do it, and you better get it done on time, and you better drive business value, and you better be able to tell me what that business value is. Business value not to the IT organization, but business value to Susie, who's on the front line, who's trying to get her uh, PC to reboot fast enough because there's some error on it, and she's incented on her revenue that she does. You better make Susie's life better, number one. And number two out of that was, we don't, we don't have a lot of money and a lot of time to wait around for you guys to figure this out. So you better get on with it, put a list together, and go for it and do it and get it on time. So the answer is it was leadership. It was our own internal personal need as a group to turn and change and grow. And also as a, as a company to our customer, our internal customer and our external customer, we need to fix this because it's not looking pretty out there. We haven't done a lot of change here. We haven't done 400 changes. We've done 20 in the last year because we're so single-threaded in what we're doing. We can't get more through. And we're slow in our company now. 
we're slow on our ability for people to get there. <coughs> it's our problem, not theirs. Does that answer? It definitely wasn't an outpouring of fin financial funds. It wasn't Santa Claus. Prioritize applications, we talked about that. Um, developing templates, developing standard QA and UAT processes, and developing assignments. The last three are really about how do we, great, we've worked together, we've talked together, I know your role, you know my role, great, we have these great things, these new tools, we can do it, but huh, how are we gonna make sure that we do this consistently and somebody else can go find out what we did so they can do it because it may be a new short person that picks it up next time. Vince did it this week. He's done with it. But 10 weeks later, oh, we're going to bring you in and you need to do that. Here's all the documents. Now you get a sense of what it is. What, what are the requirements? What were the requirements? What was the version? What was the license key? What, when did they want it done? When was it done? What groups got it? All those things that one person in your organization probably knows. You're probably the person. Probably the person that knows that, but for some unknown reason, uh, you decide to retire after 35 years. What are we going to do with that? So, knowledge management is really what that is. Last three moments. How do you manage knowledge management? Because you got to be able to pass that on or give that to others to be able to move that forward. So, make a dent in your universe. <laughs> we went after it. We tried to make a dent in this universe of. Not, you know, it was probably spinning a little slower than it needed to be. We wanted to change it. We knew we needed to change it. We were being asked to change it. The swimming side of it. So, this was a time as we were going through this part of the process where we felt like we were swimming and we didn't know if we were going to drown or if we were going to actually make it, but we had defined on the left. Is everybody? This is a swim lane diagram, it's also what I call it swimming. And I feel there's an expand here. So on the side here are the roles that were defined. <coughs> and those roles come across. Okay. And then they're they define phases. The engineering team or the team defined phases so they knew where was that package in that process. We also defined this so that when we brought someone else on, we could drop that in front of them, put that there, put the roles there and they have a sense of where they fit and what's going on in the greater scheme of what's happening here. That person may have been this quality side of it and they're working on all this stuff and they're like, where's all this stuff coming from? I don't get it. So we're able to drop people in, they're able to see the whole pattern, they're able, maybe they're doing QA right now because we don't really, we don't have any packages that they can do uh, anything else on. But maybe we want them to do QA in this engineering phase, but then we also want them to help us uh, in the production phase, so as they roll it out. Then they understand they don't go from QA to delivery. I don't know if you've ever read a blog, Scott was talking the other day. He was in, a, in one of his prime expressive uh, moods and saying, I can't believe a university of 10,000 people just created an app V package and rammed it out there. And, and that's what's happening. And he was, you know, incensed by that. How could you do that to all your students? How could you do that to all your faculty? Why can't they sit down and understand this? I mean, you, you take a minute, a minute of everybody's day because you missed something. It's a big deal. You take down a revenue system that's running 100, thousand dollars an hour, a million dollars an hour, you take it down for that hour, it's a big deal. It starts to change the bottom line. All this snow, productivity during the snow period here, January, February, March, we were dealing with that. We were dealing with people slow down because they couldn't get to their applications in the way they had done before. They had to come in and drive in. It was a problem. It slows it down. Somehow, you need to take that off, take that snow from, factor out. We can do that. Too. So, point in the swimming diagram, it's, it's a process map, it's a VSM, uh, it's a value stream map, 
It gives you some sense of lean. It gives you a sense of what's going on. And you can talk with your user. You can talk with the person that's doing a process or a role. And you can talk to your executive and tell them, hey, you asked for this, and this is where it's at in the process, and they get it. Thoughts? Good? Bad? Innovative? No way you didn't do that? Sit in the stern and battle, my canoe analogy. Is, no one knows what a canoe is, so I'll try again. <laughs> so it's about technology, this sit in the stern and battle. And, and what, it, what the technology component of this project was is implement the tools that integrate well. So things that link together. We tried to find tools that we could link quickly and, and get up and get running. We looked at, or the team looked at, automating the packaging process. How could you automate? How could you do little tweaks to make that work faster? Uh, virtualizing the physical platform. So no longer did you have to have a physical desktop in front of you running an OS, or what, how many of you have a test lab with 20 PC version models in it that you run tests on? Anybody? Drupal does. It's crazy, isn't it? You got all that power that's running, you got all that space that's running, you got all that heat that's generating, you, you mess it up, someone comes in and breaks the cord, you gotta go re-image it, redo it. We put it all back in the data center. Put it out there, found the engineering desktops made those so that they could go through the engineering desktops. If they wanted a test desktop, they flipped it into a testing environment, they were able to test it and give it to some tester out there they could get to. Getting it off of the physical side of it, because we can move now anywhere. We have some of our staff that actually has moved from one of our physical locations to a different state, just so they can work. Uh, metrics. Define the cycle times and quality measurements. Actually, Mike, I think this is one of the greatest things that they did. I know it's a small thing, but they can now, because they're able to look at what the requirements are from a user standpoint in a document, Take it, run that code through a little, I'll call it the blender, come out with a sense of, all right, here's some information I can use quickly and say, yes, that's a small package, or that's a medium package, or that's a large, or that's an extra large. And then having defined, so I define it as that, I know that it's going to take 20 hours of work. I know it's going to take three weeks during that 20 hours. So there's a duration and an effort. They've done it. It was fantastic. Even though they never saw me dance, but I was probably dancing then. Because for a project manager's dream to be able to say it's going to take us six months to get there and we need 10 people to do it. Or it's going to take three months and we need 300 people to do it. You, you can estimate, you can communicate, you can fund it, you can do something with it. We're able to do something with it. We're also able to know that that package fits you're working on. It didn't even pass the initial side of it. It's a small package, but we need to buy a new one because it's not going to make Windows 7. So we need capital out of the organization. We don't need expense dollars to repackage it. We need capital. So we have to buy the app. We have to put capital against that. That's fantastic. Your finance people probably don't want to hug you with you, unless you don't want to. They're in that other realm. Um, so. That metric really drove a lot of things that we really didn't realize until that was. So, and, and provide all levels of QA uh, environment, meaning your tier zero, your tier one, your tier two, your tier four, all the different levels, laptop, desktop, that side. So, giving that, that out. So, sitting in the stern and paddling, meaning put the technologist up front. Let the technologist be up front. They're the ones that know the virtual technology. You guys know it. Get up front in the canoe. Kind of tell us what shore you want to go against. Tell the project manager to sit back and start moving things around, get some power around what's going on. But listen, the third thing is, is listen to your executives. They need to define the speed in which you can do that. Key learning, big learning, hard to deal with. I like to be in front. It's hard to be in back. But I did set back. This is what comes up. So, tell your project manager about that. 
Um, I don't know if you picked up, but from the beginning of this, we started talking about application stack or app stack. Now it's changing into DAP. It morphed. It changed. It was first about all these applications that we have stacked up that we got to get done the stack of papers. Now it's a pipeline. It's a process. It goes through. You worked it. They talked about it. The team said, that isn't really the problem. The real problem is, is it's a process problem. We got all the tools now. Now it's a process problem. So we morphed as we worked through it. This is the physical side of it. I know that's not to the detailed spec you all love. But what I'm trying to do is give you a sense is it's pretty simple. But it's also really complex. If the smart people aren't in the room, this doesn't work. So, so now just a couple of things. So on the DAP side, on program management side, game over means if you don't do these things after you've got this put together, forget it. Why did you do it? And that's really where we're at, or where we were at. If you don't rethink what you're doing, you're going to have trouble. If you don't rethink the clash of styles, you're going to be in trouble. The finance person, what do they want? They want numbers, they want them yesterday, they want them Wednesday. The support person, the support director, what do they want? They want something that they can just push out there, it's easy, the user gets it. The concept is there easy to grab. It's in their minds. A lot of times this stuff isn't. It's not in someone's front mind. Application, stack, dap, that first application, assessment side of it is not in your user's mind. It's up to you as technologists and IT to figure that out. So you have to fit it to the organization, you have to fit it to the leadership side. You have to expect to change your approach. People are different. Imagine that. Change stakeholders. Not change stakeholders meaning get rid of them. Change how your stakeholders are working. Don't just say eat the cake. Go ahead and eat cake. You gotta do this. You gotta do that. That's the way it is. Listen. Say this is what we're gonna do. And then stop and listen. You guys are great listeners. You don't really talk much. That should be a problem. No problem. Uh, fit the use cases. What that means is, on this context, is what are you good at? What's your team good at? Figure out what that is. Fit them in there and make sure that they're successful technically. But also, as you're doing that, realize where those gaps are and start making notes. Because that's the thing you got to fill in. We have technical gaps in the Midwest right now that are gargantuan. Both coasts are starting to build it up, but they're struggling too. So find those, change your stakeholders, and not only just your technical folks or your end users, but they're also the leaders in the organization. Um, don't pre-order your game. <laughs> if you pre-order your game, how many, how many of you guys game or PS2, kids have a PS2? Come on, there's no way. Based on the penetration rate here, someone's got to have a PS2 or a, a Wii, do you have a Wii? PS1, PS1 okay. So did you pre-order your game for, well, why don't you pre-order your game? I want to get a review on it, so I'm to know more about it. You want to get a sense of what it is. Because you don't want to spend 50, what, 50 bucks now? 55 bucks, yes, thank you. <laughs> my life, my wallet's is lighter because of my son, but. Um, <laughs> energy bills to the roof, but. Don't pre-order your game on this. Don't think that you know what it is and that you're going to buy it and you're going to get it and it's going to be great. It's not. You're going to have to work through it. You're going to have to get a sense of it. Get some reviews. Talk to some people. Get a sense of what it is that you want to do down that, down that path. This is what we did. What you do, maybe smaller scale, maybe a different scale. But look for people to start committing with you about where you're going. Don't ask for a commitment or being committed because then you're putting a stake in the ground rather than a direction. This is a process after you put it in to keep moving and keep going. It's not an end point. That's, that's one of the challenges that happens there. And uh, dating uh, comes before marriage, meaning get a sense of what's going on here before you just say, hey, this is it. I'm here. We will move 
things in and out of our solution building blocks. I already know that. We've already done that. We've already ripped some things out and put some new things in. We've had some things that didn't connect. And one of the technologists came in and said, I need this. And we went, oh my gosh. Okay, well, we'll buy another server. I put his hand up and said, buy two. You know, you, you got to work through that. So don't pre-order. So win your users and execs first. Think about that. And not the game first, not the endpoint, not getting the apps out, not that side of it. Make sure you're listening to those. Elon, things you got to do. Paradigm shift, global. Make sure you think about it globally, globalized. Organizational change management, uh, age and forces. We're in a different age. We're in a virtualized age. We're in a consciousness age. You have to change that thought. You have to think differently. You have to make sure they th start thinking differently. There are different forces that are coming against us. In that, you have to think differently. We have to rethink what we're doing. Leapfrog. Yeah, we're leapfrogging. Yeah, you're going from hand installs maybe to app V. You may leapfrog a whole set of technologies. Great, do it. It's your pivot point, but figure out what it is. Don't just do that tipping point and think you'll, you'll do this enough and all of a sudden things will happen. Don't. Make a decision. Turn. Make a decision where you're going to go and start working through that as you leapfrog. Leapfrogging isn't necessarily that I'm going to jump over everybody's ideas and I'm going to get the latest and greatest. It's where am I at today? What don't I want to do because it's a waste of my time? And what do I, what, what do I see there that can do something for me? So, sorry, I'm trying to move through this a little faster. You can ask questions. So, winning. When you're winning, when game's on, so when you're winning hearts and minds first, you've got to get people together. Questions. My voice is about done, so <laughs> thoughts. Are, are any of you at that point? Say again, Vince. It's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing process. It is. How many of you are on XP? All your desktops, or 50, greater than fifty percent of your desktop. Okay. How many of you have? plan or a thought out there to do something about changing that. Okay. You thought, how many of you have thought about, wow, it's probably the apps first. <coughs> that, that map is right. We went through the pain. Trust me, this map is right. I'm going to start on this side. Don't build, your, don't build your servers or your user access first. Start out here. Start to figure that out. Get that ready. Get those things going. Right. Please ask questions. I guess, uh, like for a multi-platform type app, mm -hmm. I mean, what do you what do you use for a centralized um, <coughs> storage so you can run it on multiple platforms? Yeah, that's okay. So you asked about six questions in that one. Yep. <laughs> uh, so what do we do for multiple platforms? We have those four tiers. So the desktop. So we, we've segmented. I've segmented it this way. There's a virtual set of desktops, and there's a delivery mechanism we use there, and there's a set of physical or local desktops, and there's a delivery mechanism there. What we're working through and rethinking that right now is: can we use one delivery mechanism to get all of them? Some of those thoughts are, can we use AppV to do that on both of those environments? Do we have to stay, do we use SCCM as the delivery agent for both? Or do we, like we currently have, as two delivery agents? But today we deliver apps, we install them on both systems right today. So there's a lot of rethinking that's happening after we've thought through this that's going on all the time. Of course, we're in an animal world, uh, so we have to rethink of bring that package, that program concept together, and start it in July. Keep it, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Make sure people remember what we're talking about, and then by October, everybody's give us Santa Claus came to town. You know? It takes a while. I know how it does. Thoughts? Is it a need for you guys have? 
Yes, please. Yeah, I like the concept of it. I mean, as far as you thinking just building a process around getting applications through. I'm curious, like, if it was more, it was, was it a need from leadership, administration to kind of say this is the way we're going to paradigm shift so that people that don't scream loud just fall in the blender and come out at X amount of time so you, you get away from people thinking they're the emergency? Does it just have to come from administration to say this is the paradigm shift and IT is not the bad guy, this is, everybody embraces this new process. Yep. Um, first off, you're always the bad guy. Because whatever you did, you gave a process that didn't do what I wanted you to do or whatever. So, right. uh, but to answer your question, it came from not a direct item from leadership, from the CIO. It actually came out from the guy who was sitting in front of you to the right and said, I got to do something because we can't keep walking in front of him and saying, I want more money and do this thing and not be able to describe what thing is put some meat around it to also to be able to express it to the organization and say this is an application and this is why we're going to buy a new version of it this is what it costs this is the time it takes to do it and be very specific about it so that it isn't like hey it's a great thought also, from the user aspect, um, our users are at a point where they really don't effectively communicate the incidences that they deal with. Therefore, we don't really understand their problems. So what we have to do, unfortunately, is have a dialogue with them all the time. It isn't like we get those, from an ITIL standpoint, all those problems put together and they say, you know, our, uh, Conversion time when we have uh, a 2010 Excel file coming in takes 20 minutes. Can you do something about that? And we have 50 users asking for that. We don't have that right now. That's something that is a structural organizational challenge that we're continually working on. So, it answers a simple question. It bore out of some visionary thinking and listening to what the leadership is talking about.